thank you for joining us for the Conform to Christ podcast, where we aim to engage the mind, affect the heart, and call people to follow Christ. My name is George Mays, and with me as always is Jay Jones. Hello. How you doing today, Jay? Not bad. Not bad. It's Monday for us, but Tuesday. It's Monday, yep. Tuesday for the listener. Well, uh, you know, Mondays can be, um, be a difficult day for pastors. <clears throat> yeah. They can be. I mean, there's there's those days when you uh, you just have you're thinking about the sermon that you preached the day before. You've got things that you wish you would have said, maybe something that you wish you hadn't said. You can feel kind of down. You can, yeah. I'm usually just tired on Mondays. Are you? Yeah. Um, I, I'm like emotionally invested in everything that happens Sunday. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's more than just like going to church and preaching. That's right. Well, my uh, my pastoral or my preaching professor in seminary, he he would always remind uh, uh, our class that preaching, it's spiritual warfare. Like you're not just out, you're not, you don't just go up on the stage and give a speech. Mm-hmm you are actually proclaiming God's word. And so there is this spiritual um, atmosphere mm-hmm. around you. And, and yeah. so that's that's one of the reasons why you feel so drained when you're done is because you've, you've been actively um, engaged in a spiritual war. Yeah. I can see that. So, yep. And uh, I, I think that's a good reminder for... Um, for the congregation also mm-hmm. that this is this is not just a speech right it's not just a lesson it's, it's not like going to a class and and hearing a, a teacher give a yeah. lesson yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and so you have to actively be engaged in the sermon actively yeah. listening to it um and, and there's spiritual warfare going on while you're trying to listen yeah mm-hmm. so yeah so today is Text Driven Tuesday. Yes. And so we'll talk about the sermon that you preached uh, on Sunday. And this was uh, the end of John chapter 16. Right. Yeah. Uh, a, a larger portion. Mm-hmm. Um, those, those, can, those come with their own <laughs> challenges, right? <laughs> yeah. Phil, Philip said, I think this is the biggest portion of Scripture you've ever preached. Really? I don't know that that... I mean, maybe. I guess I'll okay. take his word for it. Yeah. Uh, it's a big it's a big chunk and well we can talk about why you you chose to do that um in just a minute but let's um let's jump into it okay uh so let's have you read it it's a longer a longer portion right yeah you gonna be able to do it i'll i'll do my best okay all right (laughs) well we'll we'll look uh if you have your bibles you can open it to john 16 or uh, we'll put the words up on the screen uh Jay preached John 16, verses 16 through 33. So let's have you read that, and then we'll uh, we'll talk about it. Yeah, this is the end, just so you can understand what Jesus is saying. This is the end of his ministry to his disciples. Um, After this, he'll pray in John 17, what's called the high priestly prayer, and then um, he'll be betrayed and arrested. So this is his, like, kind of his last words to them to prepare them for what's coming. And he says to them, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also... You have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. 
I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will, when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. And that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father, and I have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world, and I am going back to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figures of speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is indeed... The, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. All right, so um, long, long section, mm -hmm. perhaps the longest you've ever preached. Maybe. All right. <laughs> Um, let's talk about why you decided to do 16 through 33. Okay. And then we got to talk about that intro that you, you gave to your sermon. I don't even know. We got to talk about it. Well, I'll, I'll look forward to that because I don't, I don't, you don't even, remember your intro. <laughs> yeah. I don't even remember what I said. <laughs> right. uh, are you talking about this documentary? Oh yeah. Okay. I got you. Oh yeah. 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 yeah we got to talk did about it. Did you watch it? I haven't. I haven't oh, watched buddy, it yet. Oh buddy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, why did I pick the, this long section? Well, why is why you? is it that you because you the ESV at least has two mm -hmm. two sections here. Yeah. Now we know that that those those little section yeah. divisions right. they're they're not inspired. Yeah. Um. So you you could have at, at least if you were following the ESV, and I'm I'm sure other uh, other translations probably have divisions too. You, yeah, you probably yeah. could have divided it into two. Mm -hmm. So why did you you decide to to pull it all together and do it all in one sermon? Um because this is this is kind of the last these are the last things that Jesus says to his disciples. It all kind of has one theme. Okay. Um the, and the theme I think that kind of ties it together is um joy and peace and these these men are about to have their worlds turned upside down. We we We've got to try to put ourselves in their shoes, right? right? Here's the Messiah. They are beginning. They're beginning to believe like correct theological things about Jesus, though they don't have all the pieces. They believe he's the hope of Israel, and maybe they're starting to even believe he's the hope of all the world. They, they've seen him raise someone from the dead, like you know Lazarus. That's a big deal. That happened just a little bit ago, and um, and now he's telling them, "I'm leaving," and you know, and they're going to see it. It's going to happen. He's going to. Be taken away. They're not going to see him anymore. Be crucified. He'll be buried, put in a tomb, and it's like boom. Like there's your hopes and dreams gone. Is God a liar? Uh, is any of this going to take place? Have I wasted three years of my life? Um, dark times. Jesus doesn't shy away from any of that. So there's kind of this theme. Jesus is wrapping up his final words to them to encourage them, to minister them, to prepare them. And I think it's better if taken all together than chopping it up. Um, and also the break isn't, I don't know what the break is there for, because there's really kind of three main things Jesus talks about. Mm -hmm. He talks about sorrow turning into joy. He talks about a new way of praying. I think that's obvious and it's clear. Now that's a that's a section right in the middle. And then the last thing he talks about is how you'll in the world you're going to have troubles and, and tribulation, uh, but he'll give peace uh, to his disciples that live in that world. Yeah. So there's three main ideas here, um, and I think they're held together by joy and peace. Um, I don't know. I don't know why there is a break there. But yeah. Those words, there in my Bible, my breaks say your sorrow will turn into joy. Well, that's a pretty good one. That kind of tells you what my first point is. Mm -hmm. But then it goes, I have over overcome the world, and I'm like, oh, did you forget about the section on prayer? Like, there's a section. <laughs> right. on, yeah, there's a section on prayer in here. Yeah. Um, so the break's not helpful again. Uh huh. Yeah. So just another, you know reminder all right those those things aren't inspired they're just there to help you get around yeah yeah and sometimes they do more damage than than good yeah. right <laughs> yeah I, I think... don't know if that's helpful for everybody I think you can a sermon is more than a lecture you're meant to feel something of what I think the people felt mm -hmm. like like this is a narrative Jesus speaking to disciples 
we ought to be ministered in a similar fashion. Okay. So I, I almost feel like it could be lost if we divided it up into different sermons. Right. Yeah, and I agree. And, and maybe um, a little help for people as they're reading their Bibles at home, pick pick out some of those words that he that is they're they're repeated over and over again. Mm-hmm. There there is a common theme of joy that that just carries us through this passage. Mm-hmm. And so that's I see that that's what you were doing is is pulling on that theme mm-hmm. and following it. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about this uh, this introduction. So you. You introduced us to a documentary <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> um, on Scientology. Mm-hmm. Now, I know a little bit about Scientology. Yeah. Um, and I know it's real bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what, you, what you were talking about is um, this interview with John Travolta. Yeah. Who is one of the, he's one of the he's a, higher ups, right? Yeah, they like to use celebrities to, yeah. to promote their their uh, cult around the world. Yeah. So we could spend we could spend time talking about Scientology, but we really want to talk about this this quote mm-hmm. from John Travolta. So <laughs> tell us <laughs> tell us why John Travolta is a Scientologist. All right, he said the goals of Scientology are to end all wars, to end all mental illness and criminality. Okay. And he's like, name me one other religion that has those goals. Okay. <laughs> okay. I can. All right. And then he says the center component of Scientology is joy. Okay. He said, and then he says there is no other religion whose center component is joy. And, uh, and that's <laughs> that's quite the that's right. quite the statement. Yeah, and I just thought I thought to myself, <laughs> and it's just a reminder. I mean, John Travolta's never spent five minutes talking to a Christian. At least not a Christian that is aimed at telling him the gospel. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And uh, he's probably been around cultural Christians. Probably. Yeah. Or, you know, the the liberal Hollywood type Christianity, he's, but not not yeah. this kind of Christianity, right? He, yeah, he's probably been around the type of Christians like it's about escapism, escaping hell, mm-hmm. escaping this world even. Yeah. Uh floating around in this heavenly cloudy place uh or god the, loves you or the liberal side um you know where these miracles aren't real none of these it's not supernatural it's just about bettering yourself mm-hmm. you know yeah but he's not in he's not he's never encountered a real christian as far as i could tell from and if he's if he's being honest right uh because you know the center component of christianity is all about how god's moving history mm-hmm um, along to where there is an end of all war, criminality, mental illness, and we would add sickness, mm-hmm. uh, natural disaster, everything that's wrong with this world, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Right. And it all all happens because of Christ. It's all focused on Christ, who is our joy. Yeah. So Christianity is all about joy. Yeah. You uh, you you told me this while you were working on your sermon last week. Yeah. And it's. It's funny because it's it's so ironic, right? Like when you look at the scriptures, um, to hear someone say, "Well, there's no other religion besides Scientology that's about all of these things," right? And you just flip through. I mean, you could close your eyes <laughs> and flip to a passage and point, right? <laughs> and you could you could bring out what he's talking about. Yeah, but it's also sad. Yeah, it's sad that there's. There are people, and it's not just him. There's people all around us that don't realize that Christianity is about this. Yeah, that it's it. We we've got places in John, we've got places in First John, that John says, "I'm writing this so that your joy will be complete, so yeah. that we'll, you'll have fullness of joy." Mm-hmm. And Jesus says that that it's so that we'll be full of joy. Mm-hmm. Um. And you said something that um, I thought was interesting when we were talking about this. You said that you believe more people would be interested in Christianity if we would present it like this. Yeah, I think so. The what is the the end game of the end goal? What is the end goal? And this is kind of what Jonathan Edwards was getting at in his uh, kind of. It's it's difficult to read, but 
the purpose for which you know God created the world. Right. I think I don't know if that's the entire title or not, but that's <laughs> probably just, not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's the goal of the world? The goal of the universe, and there's and they're simultaneously intertwined. The goal of the universe is the glory of God, mm-hmm. but it just so happens that God's designed His universe that His glory is our greatest joy. Right. And this is what influenced John Piper. People think this is original John Piper. It's not. Right. John Piper wrote Desiring God. He calls it Christian hedonism. Um, and some can debate whether he goes too far or not. I think we need to have a, a place for realism and understanding that um, your world's going to be full of, of pain and suffering. Yeah. Um, so, but it's still the, the center component is that um, we think we can have joy as people in this world and all of the wrong things and we can't we can't get it. And that's yeah. really uh we get back to the original sin of the garden. It was not taking God as his word and thinking that there was something else to be had. And I think if we present Christianity in the way where we say, look, the goals of Christianity, yeah, the goal is a restored environment. Like you're about environmentalism. Jesus is more about that than you are. Yeah. He's going to remake everything, right? Everything is going to be perfect. I mean, it's a perfect environment. We don't believe in escaping this place um, to go somewhere that's not like this place. It's everything you like about this place amped up a million fold and perfect. And that's all because of Jesus. Um, sickness, disease, death, all of these things are undone because of Christ. All centers on Him. And then you get to the center thing that everyone has to know everyone is running around looking for happiness. And it's always temporary; it always goes away. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's something greater beyond happiness, and that's Christian joy, and that's what Christ offers, um, as we'll see in this passage. Yeah. <clears throat> so we need to be sure that we're we're accurately talking about the gospel, mm-hmm. talking about what Christianity is. Yeah, and it's it, 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 it's, it, it's more than just like you said, escaping. Yeah. Hell. We can never forget that part of it that, you know, we're under the judgment of God and the wrath of God, but what does reconciliation with God bring? Right. That's the question. And most people say, oh, it just brings ticket to heaven. Yeah. But the answer is no, it brings reconciliation with God, mm-hmm. which is eternal bliss. Right. Right. For those who love God, God is the greatest joy. Yeah. Right. For those that don't love God, that love their, themselves, God's presence is terror. Mm hmm. We don't. I don't even know that we are able to conceptually grasp the reality of that yet, uh, and how that works. But His goodness and and who He is. Um, if you're not reconciled to Him, you're gonna hate Him. Like you don't. You're not in the people. I don't believe in eternity. Go, man. I really wish I had that God, and I could escape this place called hell. <laughs> right. They probably they clench their fists, they gnash their teeth, they weep, and they probably curse God. Mm-hmm. They probably hate Him all the more. Yeah. Um, but we believe reconciliation with God gives, we get God. Um, I can't remember what theologian said it. Uh, God is the gospel. Yeah. God is the gospel. You right. get God. Who said it? I don't remember. I don't remember either. No, but I don't remember. That's who, that's what you get. And that's. Sounds, it sounds like Piper, though. It does sound like Piper. Yeah. Sounds God like Piper. Him. Yeah. All right. So, um, Focusing on joy. Dang, we're 18 minutes in here, George. Hey, let's any... get let's get on it. Got to get going, dude. <laughs> got like we got like 60 verses to cover. All right. So the uh, the overarching idea of this passage is there are three ways that Jesus gives his people joy in a troubled world. Yeah. All right. So let's just let's jump into uh, to this first one. Mm-hmm. We've already touched on it. We have. Uh, we we don't we could spend the rest of the time talking about it, but we. We can look at these others. Uh, so verses 16 through 22, Jesus gives an unstealable source of joy. Yes. So I'll just run through it quickly so you can get... The, the general idea of this is not hard to grasp. Yeah. He's like, in a little while I'm going away, but in a little while you're going to see me. And they're like, hey, guys, what, what is this? I don't understand what he's talking about. <laughs> right. They start to talk to, again, to each other. You can yeah. see it all in the passage. It takes up a long portion. Yeah. What does he mean by a little while? He's going to the Father, and we're going to see him. And Jesus says... He can tell they want to ask, and he's like, is this what you're asking yourself? <laughs> right. And then he tells them, like, I'm going away. You're sorrow, and you're going to have sorrow and lament. Like, he's a, he's realistic about it. This is going to be a terrible time. And then a little while, you're going to see me, and your sorrow will turn into joy. 
All right. So what is he talking about here, Jay? Because we can ask the same question that the disciples do. What, what does he mean uh, a, a little while? We don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> right. right. I would love to have been there to see this dynamic right. as Jesus is talking to them. And they're, they just, it's almost like they do this huddle. Right. What's yeah, he talking yeah. about? I, I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah, what's, yeah. What's it mean? A little while you won't see me, and a little while you will see me again. I think the plainest meaning, obviously, I think um, if you just give this to like a regular person, they wouldn't come <laughs> up with some like ideas. Not, like, oh. not a, not a theologian, not yeah. a common, not a commentator. Is he talking about his uh, time between his first coming and his second coming? Uh-huh. Like, right. like they're just going to be like, oh, he's obviously talking about how they're going to kill him. Yeah. Uh, he's going to be crucified and buried, and then he's going to rise from the dead on the third day. And then they're going to see him, and he's like, okay, oh, you're going to see him, and your joy is going like, <laughs> to explode. Right. Yeah. Right? You're going to have this incredible ultra joy. Yeah. Um, and that's what he's talking about, obviously. Right. And he compares it to a woman in labor. Mm-hmm. A woman in labor, all they know is pain. It encompasses their whole entire reality. Like, yeah. that's all they have. It's everything, Right. Uh, and then immediately, though, when a baby is born, like the lady's holding a baby, it's like it never happened. Like what just happened? Like, and that's what he says. This is going to be like. So the disciples will go through that level of distress, lament. That's the language kind of using of tearing of clothes and mourning. You know, of the Old Testament. Yeah. And in an instant, they'll see him again after his resurrection, and they'll have this ultra source of joy. You call it mega joy. Mega joy, yeah. A mega joy. Right. And. The key thing about it is he says, um, no one will take this from you. Yeah. So it's a, I called it an un- unstealable source of joy. Okay, so what is this? What it, What is the source of joy? He gives this unstealable source of joy. Is it their circumstances? Right. Is it is it some, um, some emotion that he's going to give mm-hmm. them? What What is the source of joy that he's talking about? I think he's talking about himself, obviously, in the text. That's what it's got to mean. Um, your sorrow is going to turn to joy when when you see me again. <laughs> right. And so the source of joy is himself. Okay. And the reason it can never be taken away is because now Jesus is unstoppable. Yeah. Like he he humbled himself, mm-hmm. allowed himself to be crucified as part of God's plan. He was he was killed, and he was buried. Now, but now he's conquered death. Right. Yeah. Our enemy, the great enemy of all men, is death, and right. the wages of sin is death. Jesus has beat death, mm-hmm. he, and now he's raised in this glorious body. He's literally untouchable to the world. Yeah. So, so the Christian's joy will always be found external to themselves. And happiness, I've heard people say happiness is what happens to you. And that's right, right? We, our, bar- our happiness level goes up and down through life. And Jesus isn't saying you're going to be have this. Joy is an emotional experience, I believe. It, it is an emotion, but he's not saying you're always going to be happy. In fact, as we'll see, we get to this tribulation part. Like there are going to be periods of time where you're not happy at all. Yeah. But the difference is, there is a source of joy that's external to you, which can be ministered to you in any circumstance. Right. To where no matter what's going on in the Christian life, they have Christ, and they'll always have Him. So they'll always have a joy yeah. that can never be stolen from the by them from the world or any circumstance. Right, and I I think that we can we can grasp this in our own lives. The deepest source of joy in our lives doesn't come through stuff, and it doesn't come through situations. It comes through relationships, right? Yeah, like the deepest the deepest sense of of joy and peace that I can have is being with my wife. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the joy that he's talking about, it's found in a relationship. It's found in a person. Mm-hmm. And the, the happiness that we have with, with the relationships we have here, it can be stolen from us mm-hmm. because tragedy strikes. Yeah. You know, everyone goes away. They, they die. But Jesus, like you said, he's, he will always be with us. Yeah. So once you enter into that relationship with Christ, you have that relationship forever. It, it stretches from now into forever, mm-hmm. into eternity. And so what we need to do is we need to remember that um, Christianity is centered on a relationship with a person. Yeah. And 
Um, so that that should affect the way that we live each day. Yeah, that should accept, um, that should um, affect how we read our Bibles. That should affect our prayer life, right? Mm-hmm. As we see it as a relationship. Yeah. Um, and that our joy is found in a person. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Um, so the the second point springs out of, of the first one because yeah. it's a relationship. It's a person. That's the source of our joy. The second point that you brought out is that Jesus gives us a new way to pray. Yeah. And that's found in verses 23 through 28. Yeah. Um, and the ESV decided that it was just going to lump that in there <laughs> somewhere. It wasn't going to well, give a Yeah, part a of it's in the break. one section, part of it's in the other section. <laughs> right. You're like, oh man, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so Jesus gives us a new way to pray. So what is that? What is it? so? I'm teaching a Sunday school class on prayer um, right now, and what we have to do is we have to um, get around what is often thought of when we we approach prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, prayer is often viewed as an obligation. It's this this burden. Mm-hmm. We all know that we need to pray more. Right. We, we need to. We we all know. I, I think every Christian has this this burden. We don't pray like we should. Yeah. Um. And we we feel like it's this chore. Yeah. So what does prayer have to do with joy? Because for a lot of Christians, I think that they don't view it in terms of joy. I think right. they they view it in terms of um something that they know that they should do that they don't do. And I, I think it becomes from understanding God in di- a different way than He's revealed Himself. Maybe and this is the okay. reality that the reality of the shift that takes place is centered on Christ. So I guess I'll say we need to realize that this new way of praying is not for everyone. Okay. Okay. So everyone prays, but not everyone p- prays like a Christian, and only a Christian can pray this way and is privileged to pray this way. Um, because of what Jesus did, and there's a little micro-gospel in 28. It tells you what secures this way of praying. I came from the Father, have come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world, I'm going back to the Father. That's just the gospel. God the Father sent Jesus into the world out of his love for us, so Jesus could die for us in our place, for our sins, rise, and then he would conquer death and ascend back to the Father, take his glorious place again, and what Christ purchased is other sons and daughters. So we pray to a father. That's who we're told to pray to. So try to change the vocabulary. And it may be difficult for people to understand like what it is to pray to a father, but God is a father. He's a good father. A lot of people have bad fathers. Think of everything a father is supposed to be and more. That's what God is, and that's who we are to him. We come to him like children to a loving father who loves to be with his children. There's a there's a, a a time in our evening that I really love because usually I have Drake and Burke both in the living room and they're both like trying to talk to me and outdo they're like trying to get a time where they can both tell what's going on in their day. Okay. And it's a fun time in the family cuz you know people we're usually laughing and both of them almost start laughing and we're having fun together and they're telling me all about what's going on in their life. And then, you know, I'm doing whatever with them. And that that is more like Christian prayer than we realize. Right. Um, and we come in Jesus' name. I could have emphasized this more, perhaps, but when we come before a holy God, he sees his own son, the righteousness of Christ. Yeah. And he doesn't see all of our—we see all of our mess-ups and right. our failures, and we can bring that and think God won't doesn't want to hear from us or us to be with him. But when we come before God, he sees the perfect righteousness of Christ. This is what Christ Christ secured in his mission. He secured for us the right to come to God this way. So when we come in his name, we are coming in his righteousness. We're also coming in his... um, It'd be like, and the illustration I use is if like some peasant were to try to go to the emperor of Rome. You can't do that, right? Right. No no one can do that. They they don't have access to him. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, uh, got some issues on the farm. Uh, No. Um, But a general can go to the emperor, and sometimes a general can send people in his own name. Like, who are you? Why are you here, peasant? Well, I'm here on behalf of General George, and I'm I'm coming and asking in his name, and he needs this, right? And so the emperor would be like, okay, 
Um, so we do the same thing, except for we're not peasants. Right. We're children. Mm-hmm. We're his, the children that he loves. He's a loving father. Yeah. And so when we come, we pray in the name of Jesus. We're praying and asking for things that Jesus would ask for. Right. Um, as if he would ask. And then we covered this in chapter 14, I believe. Maybe also in 15. It came up yeah. several yeah, times. Yeah, it's come up. It's come up a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we have to grasp that reality. Like, do we understand how privileged we are to do that? Right. Who who even in the Old Testament got to do that? Yeah. Like a handful of people? Mm-hmm. That's 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 wild. I mean, that's right. mind blowing. Yeah. We're to boldly come before God in this fashion because of Christ, not because of us. And uh, what what do we find there? A God who's like, oh, you messed up all day long, and you know, you're kind of trashy. No, he sees a child of his that he loves. He sees the perfection of Christ, and he's ready to pour out joy. Like, are you ready? Are you ready for what's about to happen? Because I'm about to unleash joy upon you. You know what I mean? Right. And we have access to that anytime. Anytime. The, anywhere that we are, no matter what's going on in our life, because of Christ, we have access to pray like this. Right. Yeah. Um, so prayer is a it's a command, but it's also this invitation. It's this privilege that we're given as as Christians. Yeah. And we often um, just focus on the command side. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I'm supposed to do this. Well, you get to do this. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, Hebrews, since we have this this high priest, let us with confidence mm-hmm. draw near to the throne of grace. Yeah. right. I like what Thomas Watson um, says about prayer. He says, Christ went more willingly to the cross than we do to the throne of grace. Yes. And it, that's just such a striking statement. Like Jesus, he went to the cross to secure this access for us with the Father, and we just so often neglect it. Yeah. And we, right. don't, we don't see it as a source of joy. And that's what you're neglecting, right? You're depriving yourself of joy, right? Because the last and uh, the last thing Jesus says after he talks about his mission, he's until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full, right? So why do we lack joy? Maybe because we don't ask for the Father to lavish us with joy. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, if if we if we're lacking in joy, the the fault lies with us. It's on our side. It's it's not with God. God is is freely wanting to just overflow yeah with love and joy for the christian and if we don't if we don't have it it's probably because we're not seeking it or we're seeking it in the the wrong things we're looking yeah. for it in all the wrong places we we need to remember that we're not we're never guaranteed happiness in this life um, that sounds strange for people to hear cuz probably usually all they've ever heard about christianity is how you can be so happy you know, and your marriage will be so good, your kids will be so good, nothing will ever go wrong in your life, right? <laughs> right. You're never going to get sick, you're always going to have the best things. Right. God wants you to be happy, uh-huh. right? God's like a genie to make you happy. Yep. But in reality, <laughs> what this passage sh- shows us is the very real- the, the reality that all of the things that make people happy in life, we're guaranteed none of them. Yeah. In fact, right. we're guaranteed tribulation, as we'll see. Yeah. So, and, so Well, I was going to say this, yeah. practically... Right. If you're not happy, maybe don't think something's wrong with you. But if yeah. you're not joyful, maybe it's because you've neglected this. Right. And whatever we ask according to God's will, He gives it. We know that. God's will is for you to experience the joy of the Trinity. Mm-hmm. That's what it's all about, right? right? We get caught up into this love relationship right. that's gone on for eternity past, the center of all joy of the universe. We're brought into that because of Christ. So we ask. I'm not joyful. Help me to experience joy. I'm having a I'm having a rough week. I'm not happy. Things are bad. I'm stressed. You know, I don't know what's happening. But you've promised that I have Christ and that I can experience this this intimate times of joy and I need that. Yeah. And I think if we do, I think if we go, I think God's faithful. Yeah. To give us these times where we can rest in him and experience that joy. I'm reminded of 1 John um Chapter one, where uh, where John says uh, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. 
and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. Mm. Like that it's it's meant for us to yeah. be pulled into that fellowship with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Right. And um yeah, yeah. Jesus Jesus has joy in fellowship with his father, and the father has joy in fellowship with the son, and we're being we're mm. being pulled into that fellowship so that we can have that same kind of, of joy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So don't don't run through life going from one temporary happiness to the next. Right. That's that's the temptation. It's always there. Uh there's joy for us, and that's beyond uh circumstantial happiness. Yeah. So the the last point is that Jesus secures peace in tribulation through his victory and that's verses 29 through 33. So mm-hmm. so um let's uh let's talk about this because like you said uh, there's a lot of people out there who who present Christianity as if it's the it's the answer to all of life's troubles. Right. Um you know Joel Osteen, he's made millions of dollars off of of peddling this idea, um, he he talks about having favor, right? Having favor with God, and and the way that he interprets that is, um, he gets upgraded the first class, mm-hmm. which doesn't really strike me as true. He right. probably just flies first class on his private jet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but yeah. he this is how he talks about it um, mm-hmm. in his books. He talks about it as finding yeah. a, a close parking spot. Yeah. At the mall, you got the like, favor. This, this is the favor of God. That's, you're yeah, you're right. a child of God. You experience the favor of God. Yeah. Um, and those those seem silly to us, but this is how a lot of Christians um they view Christianity. And so when things aren't going well, they feel like God is somehow angry with them. Well, when the history books are written. People like Joel Osteen will have more burnouts and dropouts right. than they will have found that they have had people become Christians. Oh yeah, <clears throat> and because, they're not because and they're, they're not giving that joy because yeah. if you don't get upgraded the first class, yeah, if you don't get the stuff, yeah, then well something's wrong. Mm-hmm. Something's wrong with me. Yeah, um, or, or you know, and just say average Christian can feel this letdown when things aren't going well for them. They feel like, what did I do? God yeah. is angry with me because if he if he was if he wasn't angry with me, then obviously I wouldn't be experiencing this this hardship or this right. sorrow. Right. But that's not what Jesus talks about, right? No, uh, the reality of being a disciple of Jesus in the world um, is that we're going to have tribulation. Right. Um, not that they're just having tribulation while he's. They're going to betray him. Obviously, this is going to be a time of tribulation for them. That will be that will instantly go away when they see his re- see his resurrected uh, uh, body. And they're like, oh, you know, it, it's a, it's incredible joy. But the tribulation is in the world. Like the disciples will live in the world after Jesus goes back to his father and sends them on mission into the world. It's you're going to have tribulation. And we have tribulation. Every disciple of Christ will have tribulation in the world. So what? H- how would you define tribulation in the world? So the word can mean in its most literal sense to be pressed. And the, I, one thing that I kind of thought of when I thought of this is how you'd squash. You never see people press coffee. Mm-hmm. They're applying force, and they're just pushing right. that coffee press and smashing it down. Uh-huh. Um, we would use something maybe like distressed. I mean, tribulation captures it too, but we don't use that word that much. So right. to be pressed, um, and it, it covers a wide range. If you look at the word, it can mean um, there's a variety of factors that it can encompass from social, and we see that in the book of Acts, obviously, and we see it through church history, Christians. It can be physical to where you're actually physically harmed, um, emotional. I mean, we we all see that. That's probably what we most of us would experience here would be emotional, right? Um, and financial. Like, in if you look around the world, you see all those things happening to Christians, mm-hmm. and the worst parts they're getting all of them at the same time. Um, and that's the reality that Jesus says: when you go into the world, you're going to experience oppressing, mm-hmm. and it's it. There's no sign of it really ever stopping until He returns, right? Um, 
That's the reality of the world we live in. So to be a Christian, that's why he tells you, count the cost. Do you want to be a disciple of mine? Count the cost. Are you willing to take up your cross daily and follow me? That means you're on a death march. Like, salvation is a free gift. It's given freely. Um, but it's got vast implications. Um, that means you're going to live your life in tribulation. Mm-hmm. Guess what? Your neighbors think you're weird. They're going to think you're weird. You're probably not going to get invited, right, over to the cookout. Um, it's just like minor stuff, right? Right. It could be major stuff. Uh, depending on, you know, what happens and where you live, it, it, there are varying degrees of tribulation. And the, but So the, the, we live kind of in these two ways, uh, these two spheres. There's a sphere of you're in the world. See that? That's in the text. Mm-hmm. But there's also this sphere... I'm telling you this so that in me you might have peace. And he and he's saying and you can have peace because I've overcome the world. In his resurrection, he's conquered death, he's con- he's conquered the world. It's, we don't see it completed yet, but the victory is secured. And so for the Christian that is living in the world, you're going to experience all of those things. All of those stressors. Um emotional, physical, social, economic, they're there, and in the midst of all of those things, we have peace because we're in Christ. It takes us back to the the vine and the branches language yeah. from chapter fifteen, um, and that in Christ uh, we can, well, apart from Him we can do nothing, right? But in Him we have peace. Right. So, I like how you brought out the the fact that Jesus knows what it's like to experience this tribulation. Yeah. He knows what it's like to be alone, mm-hmm. to experience sorrow and, and hardship, to have people abandon him. Yeah. To have one of his best friends say he doesn't even know him. Right. And Jesus knows what this is like. Yeah. And so we have uh a, we have a faithful high priest who is able to sympathize with us because he's experienced these things. Yeah. I mean we we don't have this this God who is completely aloof and and just completely separate from us. Yeah. He's a God who has come near to us, and he has entered into the hardships of this fallen world. Mm-hmm. And so we know that he has compassion for for us. Mm-hmm. And that's that should bring us some peace. It should, if, yeah. If we, if we really think about this, if we take it out of just the, the theoretical or the, you know, just the intellectual... Well, yes, I, I know Jesus did this, but if you really meditate upon it and and really think about it, what Jesus has gone through, yeah, what he's experienced for our for our sake, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, um, that that should yeah um, fill us with peace. Yeah, I mean, and I, joy. you know, I've had times of loneliness, like everyone has. I've yeah. never had all of my friends turn on me right. and abandon me all at the same time. Right. To where I literally don't there's not a there's not a person left. Like that's what he tells them. Yeah. Oh, you really believe? Well, you're about to all abandon me. Yeah. Um and I'm gonna be alone. He says I'm gonna be alone. And and you brought out the fact that and we're we're jumping ahead chronologically, that on the cross, even God's smile turned to a frown. Right. And Jesus was utterly alone yeah yeah as as god poured out his wrath Uh upon his son yeah for our sins jesus experienced a loneliness that no one will ever experience Uh yeah um he they're all about abandoning him the but he says but the father's still with me the father helps him to get to the cross right right (laughs) he and uh but when he gets there, and he literally t- takes our sin upon himself, yeah. and the Father turns his, his face, he he, oh. exper- well, he goes from experiencing the eternal love. Right. We don't know. I mean, we know what love is now, but think of eternal love. He, he's known nothing but yeah. intimate fellowship with the Father for all eternity. Yeah. And here at this moment, it's going to become he experience wrath. It's going to become wrath. Yeah. That's why he says, "Why you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" Mm-hmm. Um, and we have no idea what that's like. Right. We'll never know what it is to have been loved for eternal from eternity past, and then to be completely alone. Mm-hmm. 
So no matter how alone you are, Christ was more alone. <laughs> That's what we said. You know, that, that should be a comfort. Yeah. And he did all of that for his people so he could secure for them this peace. Yeah. In all circumstances. It's it's not meant to be uh stop your stop your whining. You haven't experienced the suffering of Christ. Right. It's meant to be a comfort to you. Mm-hmm. You have a friend mm-hmm. who has experienced all of these things and he loves you. And he's overcome the world. And uh, we've talked about the Spirit, how the Spirit is sent to comfort them, mm-hmm. uh, to empower them to live a godly life in this fallen world. Um, and this this is meant to give us joy. Mm-hmm. So going back to John Travolta, right. you know, what other religion in the world is all about joy? Yeah. I mean, John Travolta probably paid like four hundred thousand dollars to learn what he learned. I would have gave it to him for free. Right. <laughs> That's how they do it. You know that? Like they have different levels, and they charge you. Like level yeah. one, eighty dollars. Right. Like by the time you make it to level whatever, you're dropping two hundred thousand a pop. Yeah. To get little bits of information. Uh huh. I'd give you the whole thing for free. Right. <laughs> it's right. It's right here. <laughs> yeah. It's right here. Yeah. It's it's plain. It's yeah. plain for us to see that Jesus is um he wants you to have joy. Yeah. He wants you to have joy. Yeah. Um and it's a joy that it can never be taken away from a believer. Mm-hmm. No matter no matter what you experience today, tomorrow, 10 years from now, no matter what happens with politics or with your job or with your family. Yeah. It none none of that can take away this joy. Yeah, yeah. This is a right. joy that is it goes down deep yeah and the more you and it's found in christ it's found in the person of christ the more you get to know christ the deeper your joy will be that's right that's right Right? all right that's that's totally right what's that what's that uh, those like that steps of separation to kevin bacon you know that thing Uh uh-huh how many how many is it six degrees okay yeah yeah six degrees of separation so somebody on this podcast knows kevin bacon okay Somebody get this to Kevin Bacon so he can get it to John Travolta. <laughs> Some, somebody pass it to, to Bacon so it can get to Travolta, please. Okay. All right. Are you not concerned about Kevin Bacon himself? Or well, you just, well, he he'll you get just, it too. Yeah. <laughs> just trying yeah. to just trying to get to John Travolta. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then if Travolta converts, we can plan a rescue mission to get him out of there. Okay. If you want to know more about that, you can watch the documentary. All right. But like like you don't leave. You don't just leave, right? You yep. got a plan to escape. That's right. It's crazy. That's right. Yeah. Well, took a weird turn right there at the end, Jay, but... <laughs> hey, I'm serious. <laughs> it, was good, it was a good sermon. Hey, what if it legitimately you know, it, got to him, though? Oh, it yeah. Could. I mean, we we often think of the, the life of luxury that these celebrities live, and they've got it all. Right. <laughs> they don't have Christ, yeah. and so they really have nothing. Mm-hmm. And the... Um, the sorrowful thing is that they're so insulated yeah. in their celebrity status. Like a normal person can't just walk up to these celebrities and strike up a, a conversation. Right. Um, yeah, we, we should pray for these people. Yeah. They're, they're lost. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're in an environment that is not filled with the gospel. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jay. It was good. It was good to... Um, be able to uh, look at John 16 and uh, what's coming up next. I don't know. We'll see. You're going to be back in uh, Peter, right? Yeah. Second Peter. Uh huh. I might do one more sermon. Okay. Um, and then uh, you'll be back in Second Peter. Okay. But well, I won't right. be in John, though. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, hopefully, this has been a benefit for you. We want you to pursue knowledge of Christ and knowing him more intimately so that you can have joy. So uh, if this has been helpful for you, be sure to like and share and subscribe. Get the word out. If you uh, know John Travolta, (laughs) get it to him, (laughs) right? Because we want him to know Christ and to have this joy. And uh, so we'll see you next time on another episode of Conform to Christ.